Welcome back to Carnades.org. Today we are going to be looking at a topic in applied ethics. This video is entitled Stop Giving Well, Where Effective Altruism Fails. In this video we are going to examine the position of effective altruism and then look at some very specific pointed objections to it. Now, in this video, we're going to examine the ethical position and movement put forward by Peter Singer, known as effective altruism. I'll first explain the position and their recommendations for action. Then I will offer a set of objections focused not on the claim that we should be effective altruists, but on how we should analyze the most effective ways to be altruists. I'm not going to argue with the kind of larger philosophical ethical claim of we should be effective altruists, but rather the ways in which Peter Singer and these other organizations have said that it is good to be an effective altruist. As we move forward, that will make more sense. Unlike most of my videos, I will be bringing some personal experience into these objections. For those of you who are not aware, I do work in international development. I live in West Africa. I have firsthand experience with these organizations that give internationally, these international aid organizations. Note, I'm still a skeptic. I'm just putting on Singer's position, the position of effective altruism including belief about the external world and reliability of the experience and all the other things that he claims and he believes in order to refute his position or at least show that his position has some problems via an indirect argument. Now, to understand Singer's position, the first thing we need to do is understand an ethical position called utilitarianism. I'm not going to go into all of the literature information on utilitarianism here, but very simply, this is the position that the ethical or morally good choice between several options is always going to be the one that maximizes the greatest happiness or pleasure for the most people while minimizing the most pain and suffering for the most people. Basically, what utilitarians are saying is good things depend on kind of the consequences of your actions and how we're measuring those consequences is just based on pleasure or pain created. Utilitarianism could be described as a consequentialist ethical viewpoint. This means that our actions are assessed based on the consequences that they have, not the intentions. And this is important and it will come up later. You may intend to do good by putting money in a donation jar, but if that money actually goes to fund child slavery, let's say, your act was probably not good. You funded child slavery. And while you might write a check to a charity just because it makes you look generous, if it actually educates impoverished children, it still might be good. Or it might not. As I noted, we're not going to argue utilitarianism and consequentialism versus other ethical viewpoints right now. We're taking on all of Singer's position and then looking at some of the problems for how he implements it. So, a central element to Singer's position is that when judging the positive consequences of your actions, everyone is equal. You have no more or less responsibility to feed a starving child in front of you than you do to feed one all the way around the world if you are capable of it. The central point here is that we should care about the gravity of a situation more than the proximity. It is better to save lives and stop suffering far away than to eliminate less suffering or save fewer lives closer to home. We may have an emotional reaction to those people that are right in front of us and want to help them, but it's actually better for us to be thinking about the people that are distant if we can do more good for those people. Basically, we should not privilege the interests of those close to us over those whose suffering is greater. And it seems there are certain situations where we can do more good than others. If you only had $5 to give, where would it be best spent? Chipping in to pay for one twentieth of the $100 treatment of the child in front of you? or buying a bed net to prevent malaria for a child, saving one whole child from a disease, or 
being one twentieth of the people that need to save one child. For that child in the developing world, Singer would argue that since you can do more good with your money by sending it abroad, you should. And the way that international currency markets work out, he's often right. It seems that I can do more good with my $5 by sending it abroad or sending it to foreign countries or countries where people are much poorer than I am, especially if I'm from or living in the quote-unquote developed world then I can do more good abroad than I could in front of me. But my emotions get in the way of my feeling. If I see starving child sitting right in front of me, I'm probably going to give them my leftover sandwich as opposed to spending money I might have used instead of on a sandwich and donating to other organizations. According to Singer, it is not just charitable or supererogatory to do this. We have a moral duty or responsibility to do this. This is kind of the second point he's going to bring in. For Singer, it's not just going over the top to give money to charity. It's not just something that you can do if you want to, but you don't morally have to. For Singer, we have a moral duty to give to charity and help stop the suffering of people in foreign countries or people who are suffering anywhere. Though Singer does not go so far as to completely eliminate the distinction between what we are morally obligated to do and what we may do to go above and beyond, he drastically redraws it, setting the bar much higher, especially for those living in affluent countries. For Singer, the point is not that we're getting rid of the idea of charity altogether, but that our moral duty that where you have to do at least this to be a good person should be set higher. It should be set at a point where you are donating significant portions of your income to charity. And then if you want to donate even more, that would be considered charitable or going over the top. This part of Singer's argument might be summarized as follows. We have a moral obligation to do the most good that we can. We can do more good by giving to people in the developing world than we can by giving to people in the developed world. Therefore, we have a moral obligation to give to people in the developing world. I'm using the terms developed world and developing world very loosely here. I'm trying to get across the general argument, not get into the specific semantics of how we're defining different parts of the world. However, Singer does not stop there. According to Singer, there are particular charities that are better to give to than others. It would seem most of them are probably better than the charity that's giving to the child slavery fund we talked about earlier. If you're donating a dollar, according to Singer, you would not want 99 cents to go to overhead costs and only one cent to go to the actual process of saving lives. Where should you donate your five dollars? If you could choose between a program that would take $4.95 to pay their employees and cover other costs and only take the five cents to pay for bed nets or one that spends the $4.95 on the bed nets and only five cents on the overheads, you probably want to pick the latter, at least according to Singer. And this criterion is going to naturally privilege some causes over others. Because we're focusing on that specific impact, that physical, tangible impact that you're having, we want things that have that physical, tangible impact. Singer has an organization that ranks various charities called Give Well. Of the eight charities listed on the webpage, seven focus solely on directly providing health care. So providing bed nets, providing cures for various diseases, and so on. These programs had the lowest costs and, according to Singer, the highest return in lives saved and pain averted. These are the organizations that you will do the most good for your money with. There are also very similar organizations known as The Life You Can Save and Giving What We Can, which are also at least founded by or inspired by Singer, which promote the same charities. For simplicity's sake, I'm just going to focus on Give Well, but the arguments that I'm offering for the most part apply to Giving What We Can and The Life You Can Save as well. This part of the argument might be construed as follows. We have a moral obligation to ensure that we are doing the most good for every dollar that we donate. The charities listed on Give Well do the most good per dollar 
of any charities. Therefore, we have a moral obligation to donate to the charities listed on Give Well. It seems pretty simple. Once you've accepted kind of the ideas of utilitarianism, doing the most good, and putting your money where it can have the biggest impact, this argument seems pretty natural. Now, how are the charities chosen? GiveWell focuses on four criteria. Effectiveness, cost effectiveness, transparency, and room for more funding. They look for charities that are evidence-based and focus on improving their work. The top charity they promote is the Against Malaria Foundation. This is an organization that fights malaria by donating treated bed nets to affected communities. I'm not going to go into all of the information on whether bed nets are a good or a bad choice when it comes to treating malaria specifically, how effective are they, and so on and so forth. There's a lot of data on that specific question on the GiveWell website and on the Against Malaria Foundation website as well. Before you rush off, to donate to these organizations out of some sense of moral duty, I have some objections to offer. Others have objected to Singer's work by claiming that we have different responsibilities to our family and friends than to strangers, that there is not some general equality of responsibility or need, or perhaps to the consequentialist method of identifying goods with consequences, that maybe goods are more related to our intentions or what makes a good person. In this, I'm going to do neither. I'm going to object to the claim that donating money to the organizations listed on GiveWell is not in fact the way to do the most good in the sense of effective altruism that Singer is talking about. I will argue, in fact, that it does more harm than good. I will claim that charities which minimize overhead actually are less effective than those that use their funds to address other concerns while still doing the work. That there are actually good things that one can do by not just necessarily using all of your money to fund a particular thing that you're giving to people. Finally, I will request, as an aid worker myself, that GiveWell re-examine its methodology of assessing charities. I'll focus on their top charities, the Against Malaria Foundation, and Give Directly, because the Against Malaria Foundation represents seven of the eight top charities relatively well in what they do, and it's the top charity, and Give Directly is the only one of the seven out of eight that acts in kind of a different way. Now, before getting into the specific objections, I want to talk about what I will call short-sighted utilitarianism. Now, short-sighted utilitarians are those who tout the short-term benefits of particular actions while ignoring or being ignorant of long-term harm. An example might be someone that says, it's good to burn fossil fuels since electricity saves lives, while ignoring or being ignorant of the harm they do to the planet and the arguably greater wrong that is done. Now, if you disagree with that claim or find problems with it, that's fine. The point is that at least within our utilitarian calculus of goods and bads, we shouldn't just look at the short-term benefits. We should at least include thinking about the long-term ramifications of what we're doing. In the following objections, I will demonstrate that the long-term harm that these organizations do outweighs the good done. Now. We're going to have some thought experiments in these objections, so turn on your imagination. Imagine that you are a factory worker in the American Midwest. You live in a small community where a canvas-making factory has recently closed down. Most of your friends and neighbors are out of work. A Swedish aid organization comes to your town. They tell you that they are trying to stop the flu worldwide. According to the aid organization, if you eat dinner alone under a tent, you'll be much less likely to contract the flu, because some study they've done has found that transmission of flu mostly occurs during dinner when you're talking to people and eating and doing all these things. If you sit alone under a tent, you'll be fine. They pour thousands of dollars into giving out free tents and trying to convince people to eat alone under them. You value eating dinner with your family every night. And are much more concerned about having a good job than stopping the flu. So you ignore them. 
your friend that works at a camping supply store loses his job because of all the tents that are being given out. And the store eventually goes out of business. And ironically, you note that the canvas being used to make those tents is being made at one of the factories that put the original factory in your town out of business. Just imagine yourself in that situation right now. An interesting aside, the World Health Organization estimates that the flu and malaria kill around the same number of people every year. The flu is between 250,000 and 500,000, while malaria is between 236,000 and 635,000. So these are comparable diseases, at least in the number of people that they kill and the amount of harm that they do. So if you say, well, malaria is a serious health concern, whereas the flu really isn't, not according to these statistics. This brings us to the first objection. Short-term interventions do long-term economic harm, or at least they can. Dambisa Moyo's book, Dead Aid, does a great job of explaining, and I highly encourage, if you're interested in this kind of stuff, to read the book. There's a mosquito net maker in Africa. He manufactures around 500 nets a week. He employs 10 people who, as with many African countries, each have to support upwards of 15 relatives. As someone that lives in West Africa, I can corroborate that. However hard they work, they can't make enough nets to combat the malaria-carrying mosquito. Enter vociferous Hollywood movie star who rallies the masses and goads Western governments to collect and send 100,000 mosquito nets to the affected region at the cost of a million dollars. The nets arrive, the nets are distributed, and a good deed is done. With the market flooded with foreign nets, however, our mosquito net maker is put out of business. His 10 workers can no longer support their 150 dependents, who are now forced to depend on handouts. And one mustn't forget that in a maximum of five years, the majority of the imported nets will be torn, damaged, and of no further use. So, Imagining this scenario, let's look at the short and long-term effects of bed net distributions. Remembering that the number one charity that GiveWell promotes is the Against Malaria Foundation, whose number one project is bed net distributions. GiveWell and the Against Malaria Foundation only look at the immediate positive effects, not the long-term harm. So let's see. Short-term. 100,000 people are safe from malaria for five years. That's a huge impact. There's a lot of lives that could be saved there. That's a very good check in the positive column. However, 11 people have lost their jobs. 165 people have become dependent on aid to survive. Because remember, we have the 150 dependents of the employees, plus the manufacturer himself, who's out of a job as well. After five years, there's no longer to anywhere to buy nets. So the nets that fall apart for after five years or get holes, they degrade. But now there's no place to buy nets. There's no place to replenish that supply. So those 100,000 people can once again be exposed to malaria. We only did the good for five years. And we have to come in with another million dollars in five years later to fix the problem again. But also, there's no incentive for anyone to start a net factory again, since donations will inevitably put it out of business, and the amount of capital required to get that started up would be a problem. So if no one comes in five years later to make another huge donation, because we've gotten fatigued with seeing all these people just dying from malaria and we don't want to donate anymore, then... The problem is there's no longer a factory to fix those short-term problems and actually supply the people with the nets that they need. And furthermore, the infrastructure, the building of the factory, and the knowledge to produce and actually make money and develop and grow is lost. The government is given the incentive to wait for foreign donors to solve a problem rather than listen to its constituents. So not only does this affect the businesses and the people on the ground, but 
it also means that the government no longer has that kind of incentive of the people demanding someone maybe fix this significant public health problem because the government says, well, we'll just wait for a foreign aid organization to do our job for us. It seems to me that while there is significant benefit from the original donation of the nets, there is also significant harm. And that harm in the long term outweighs the benefits. But in the rest of this video, we'll get into some more specifics to hopefully bolster that point. Give well sees the short-term effect of passing out nets, pats themselves on the back, and moves on. The problem is that charities like the Against Malaria Foundation are not held accountable to the people that they serve, those poor international communities. They're held accountable to their donors and organizations like Give Well. While the communities want real, sustainable change, donors want big, easily trackable numbers and pictures of sad children. The organization is actually incentivized to create programs that are unsustainable, like bed net donations, because if they actually worked, they would be out of a job. If we actually created a system by maybe training people up or investing in factories that produce those bed nets and then selling them, the people that ran corporations like the Against Malaria Foundation would not have a job anymore, and there'd be no more reason to donate to them, because we'd have actually solved the problem. But as long as we only invest in unsustainable projects, projects that we're going to keep having to invest money in over and over again, the people at the foundation and at Give Well will still have a job. And Moyo's example is real. I live in an area of West Africa that does have a high prevalence of malaria. Before aid organizations came in, you used to be able to buy a bed net on the street. Now, distributions are done once every two years about. These distributions put all the bed net makers out of business. So if you don't have a net and you actually want to avoid getting malaria, you'll have to wait until the next distribution to get sec or get secondhand nets that have holes and often don't work. There's a huge problem right now because there are communities that realize they need a bed net to prevent malaria but are unable to get them because they have to wait a year or two for another distribution. By giving bed nets, we keep these people dependent on foreign aid and steal the jobs from locals and give them to the foreign aid organizations and to factories elsewhere. And overall, the numbers are clear that aid in general actually hinders growth. I'll quote Moyo again. Study after study after study, many of them the donors own, have shown that after many decades and millions of dollars, aid has no appreciable impact on development. For example, Clemens et al. 2004 concedes no long-term impact of aid on growth. Hajim Michael? 1995 and Reichel, 1995, find a negative relationship between savings, the savings of the people in the country, and aid. So the more aid you have, the less savings you have. Boone, 1996, concludes that aid has financed consumption rather than investment, and foreign aid was shown to increase unproductive public consumption, that's the government spending money on not productive things, and fail to promote investment. Aid makes our foreign countries more consumers, which is great for businesses back home. We want to be selling our products to other people. But it's not good for those countries because those countries don't develop their own economy and don't develop their own infrastructure and jobs and companies and their own exports. Because, heaven forbid, we'd be financing those things, because if we start financing those things, we might be putting people out of work back home, which is definitely not what we're trying to do here. Basically, Moyo is claiming that studies reinforce the claim that aid does not increase investment or savings, but rather encourages corruption in government and consumer spending, which might have temporarily positive effects, but since the money is being spent mostly on foreign products, since aid does destroy local businesses and a lot of these countries don't have their own infrastructure or business or exports that people could buy, it has no net positive impact. Furthermore, Moyo goes on to explain how the countries that have had the most aid invested in them have in fact stopped growing since the aid started to be invested. Over the last 30 years, they averaged a growth rate of negative 0.2% a year. So those countries that have aid invested in them 
are actually not only not growing, they're slowing down. They're having negative growth on average. So, objection one. To be clear, my first objection to Singer's argument is that it represents only a short-sighted utilitarian perspective. That while the programs he promotes may do some good in the short term, they fail to take into account the economic harm specifically they do over the long term. The projects that he promotes may provide some health benefits in the short term, but they provide economic harm in the long term. Now you may say, well, having a larger population is actually going to help the economics in the long term. Well, I'm not so sure about that. It seems that one of the biggest problems in Sub-Saharan Africa is an extremely large, growing, young population. And those people are fighting each other out for jobs or trying to immigrate to other countries and not thinking about improving their own country. Why aren't they thinking about improving their own country? Well, a lot of it has to do with aid organizations, but we'll get to that point later. For now, let's talk about choice. Remember the example of the Swedish NGO coming in to cure the common cold or the flu? If they had asked the people what they wanted, they would probably have said jobs. In response, the NGO could have created a job training center, for example, which was actually what the community needed and what the community wanted to prepare factory workers to find work in jobs that required higher qualifications, which is a serious problem in hard-hit factory towns right now, because you have a lot of people that may have just lost their job but no longer have the qualifications to get back into the workforce at a different job. However, the NGO, instead of asking what the population wanted or what the population needed, decided from afar what they needed, since curing a disease has more nice numbers and clear effects and easily measurable outcomes that make donors happy and is easier and cheaper to measure than giving people job skills. It's hard to measure if people have job skills. It's possible and you can do it, but it's harder to and it costs more money in overheads to do it. And so they decided to do something that had clearly low overheads but wasn't necessarily what the people needed. In my experience, many developing communities do not find the disease that we target to be their most pressing concern. As we noted, the flu and malaria kill about the same number of people every year. In my country, malaria is considered basically another version of the flu. They don't even, in some of the languages, have different words for them. And by following prevention guidelines is similar to everyone saying, going around trying to convince you to get a flu shot. Most towns in America would not list the flu as their main concern if someone were to come in and give them aid. Just any more than many villages in Africa would not list malaria as their main concern. They want jobs, they want infrastructure, and they want growth. Furthermore, projects that actually have community buy-in and address a need that the people are invested in will be more successful. The people in the Midwest were not interested in eating under tents because they didn't value preventing the flu and they really did value sitting around the tent or table and having dinner with their family, any more than many people in malaria-affected countries are interested in sleeping under bed nets. They do not see malaria as their biggest concern. They want a milling machine or electricity or a bowl, borehole for water. If the only ones that care about a project are the foreigners, then as soon as they leave, the project will stop. Now, it's important to note that there are some communities that are very seriously concerned with these health issues that people bring in from afar. However, the problem is that unless every single community that you're hitting is really concerned with that specific global health issue, you're not giving them choice because you're just saying, well, we decided that this is something that you need. And look, this community actually wants it. And sometimes communities will nod and smile and say, yeah, that's definitely what they need because they know that's what will get the foreign aid organization to give them money or give them things. Whereas if they say, no, that's not what we need, the aid organization will just go to the next village until they find one that wants the thing. That's not really giving them choice. It's just already choosing what you're going to affect and then picking where you're going to work based on who's going to pretend to want that thing. And even if the project saves fewer lives, there is something to be said for the pleasure that someone gets from having a say in their own development. If people are given a choice, they will be happier with the results 
even if things turn out worse, because they know that they had a part in it. If people are allowed to choose what they need themselves, they will learn to learn from their mistakes instead of how to please foreign organizations, which is what the skill that most people are learning in developing countries right now. Having a say contributes to happiness, yet it is not taken into consideration in Singer's calculus of the impact of the money you are donating. Your donation of $10 saved two lives and made 100 people feel like their voice doesn't matter because you chose what they needed. They didn't get to choose. In his book, The White Man's Burden, William Easterly discusses why so many aid efforts have failed over the years. He examines why, after discovering that there is a negative correlation between aid and growth, the more aid a country receives, the lower its GDP, we still think that pouring aid into these countries will help. Easterly claims that one important difference between successful and unsuccessful projects is whether the implementers are planners or searchers. Here's how he explains the distinction. In foreign aid, planners announce good intentions, but don't motivate anyone to carry them out. Searchers find things that work and get some reward. Planners raise expectations, but take no responsibility for meeting them. Searchers accept responsibility for their actions. Planners determine what to supply. Searchers find out what is in demand. Planners apply global blueprints. Searchers adapt to local communities. Planners at the top lack knowledge of the bottom. Searchers find out what the reality is at the bottom. Planners never hear whether the plan got what it needed. Searchers find out if their customers are satisfied. The point here is that those people that plan things from a distance and then implement them on a community without finding out anything about the community have problems. Whereas people that search on the ground in the community for what that community needs and provide that community with the necessary incentives to get something done are going to have much more successful projects. My point is the organizations that are promoted by GiveWell and Singer are not concerned with asking what communities need. They're concerned with giving donors what they want. They are accountable to the donors, not the customers. They are planners, not searchers. They are trying to put things on communities that the communities do not want or haven't at least asked for because it is part of a larger plan instead of finding out what those communities want and helping them get there. And so as soon as the aid organization is done and leaves, the communities will give up on whatever project the aid organization had in mind because they didn't want it in the first place and go back to whatever they actually needed. Think of it like this. Imagine that your local fast food restaurant was a charity, that it is accountable to a board of donors instead of the customers. The board of donors doesn't care if your order is correct or timely, or that a good number of orders are correct or timely. They just want a picture of one or two people eating food and looking happy. They don't care if you want to come back again. They care about the sheer number of people fed that were hungry. They would not care that the town wanted a burger joint instead of something else. They would give you spicy Korean food because that's what they've decided that you need. They don't want to promote the food to you by making it better. They would rather spend that extra money to promote the organization to other donors to get more money. The service at such a place would be terrible because they're not accountable to the consumers. They're accountable to the donors. When you don't give the consumers, the recipients, the people that you're helping the choice or the perspective, or the voice in their own development, the product that you create, the project that you do, is necessarily not going to be what they need, or what they want, or not going to work well, because you're not listening to their feedback. So objection number two. Projects are more successful, and people are happier, when they have a choice in the project that is done. The vast majority of GiveWell's top charities give the recipients absolutely no choice in what intervention they receive, because those charities have already decided the thing that they want to work on, and then they're just going to go around to villages and say, here's what we're giving you. 
And even any amount of choice would be, does your village want this? No? Okay, we'll go next door and give them the money and infrastructure and other things that come with this thing we're giving. Even if a village doesn't want that, of course they'll say yes, because they'll be seen within the village as, oh, the village next door got this nice set of bed nets or nice set of things. Giving people the freedom to choose what will help them should be more important than outside organizations deciding what is best for them. To be clear, the objection is that not letting the community decide what intervention they need decreases the overall pleasure that is created by a project to a great enough degree that it outweighs the slight extra cost that it would take these charities to care about what the community that they are serving actually want. A notable exception to this is the one Give Well charity that does not focus on health, but rather on direct donations to individuals in developing countries. This charity allows donors to give money directly to individuals. While this certainly gives recipients choice in how they use their money, it will fall prey to the previous objection, that it only increases spending, not investment, as well as the next one, especially the next one. Let's go to another thought experiment. Imagine that you are a parent and your daughter is getting bad grades at school. You hire a tutor and tell him you want to ensure that your daughter gets better grades. The tutor asks you if you would rather get her better grades through a data-tested, efficient with method with minimal costs required per grade or a less efficient, more expensive method that might not get results and makes it harder to measure success. You, of course, pick the first, and immediately her grades improve. After a few months, you ask the tutor what they have been doing. He explains that he's simply doing all the work for your child. Your goal was to improve your daughter's grades. The most cost-effective way to do that was just to do the work for her. The tutor is doing exactly what the aid organizations are doing, or these particular ones are doing. He is correct that the cheapest, most easily testable, most time and cost effective way for your daughter to get good grades is for him to do the work for her. What he failed to mention was that this left out the most important part of the equation, what we would call sustainability. You want your daughter to be trained to do the work when the tutor is gone, even if that would take more time and money or be harder to measure or less efficient. Give Well and its charities do very little to teach the communities they serve how to do the work, while instead choosing to do things the cheapest way possible, just doing it for them. If you think that our education system should just be the people that already understand how to do it, doing it for everyone else, then this is a good method of development for you. But if you think that our job should be training people how to do it, then you are someone that cares about and is more committed to sustainability of projects. Let's look. Give Directly, the charity mentioned earlier, of the one of the top eight charities mentioned by GiveWell that doesn't focus on health issues and does give people much more choice in their development, proudly claims, This year we plan to provide entire communities of people a basic income, regular cash payments that are enough for them to live on for more than 10 years. While this might seem to give people the basic necessities for years, it might seem kind to do that, it creates dependency. This is great for aid organizations, since just like a drug dealer, if their clients are dependent on them for years, they will never be out of a job. In the same way that the bug net distributors put any competition out of business, guaranteeing that they will always have a population to provide nets to. Funding people makes them dependent on you and the money you bring, so they'll keep needing more money. And so you'll keep having an organization and keep having work and a job and keep having to pay more money in. The longer you sustain a community on foreign cash, the more that infrastructure to make money in other ways deteriorates, the less skilled knowledge is retained, and the less people are motivated to work and make money for themselves. Is our goal to wean these communities off of aid or get them more addicted? If you want to be self-sufficient, it seems counterproductive to pour more aid onto them. If you want to quit smoking, for example, why would you suddenly start smoking more? It sounds like you actually want to keep smoking, just like these organizations are actually keeping these people in poverty. Furthermore, 
When the work that a government should be doing for their people is done by others, that government loses its function. When tax revenues are not expected to go back to serving the people, and this is considered the responsibility of foreigners, governments become necessarily more corrupt and use that money for other purposes. And there are numbers of studies that have shown the more aid you put into a government, the more corrupt it becomes. For example, the budget of the government of the country that I live in is over 95% aid, yet they provide almost no services to their people because the expectation of both the people and the government is that foreign organizations will provide these services. If a community thinks that they don't have necessary roads or a well, they won't look to their government to do that. They will look to aid organizations to do that. And that's the problem. And in fact, the most aid organizations are heavily taxed, and that revenue then is not reinvested. So where does that budget go? Well, it goes to, of course, lining the pockets of the government themselves, since that government is the one that's allowing the aid organizations to work there. Since the population pays next to no taxes, they are not invested in caring what the government does with their budget. So once again, you increase corruption and increase, more importantly, dependence on aid, because you destroy those institutions that might exist in the government to actually do the good work, and you put the expectation for both the people and the government to the foreign aid organizations to provide those social safety nets that otherwise should be provided by a government. A deeper problem created by aid is the general lack of motivation to solve problems of one's own community. This is something that's much more difficult to measure, but if you spend some time in a community like mine or a country like the one I'm living in, you'll truly have a better understanding of it. Why should you try to fix a road if an aid organization is going to come and do it? Why should you try to keep your children healthy when an aid organization wants to do it for you? Why save money when foreigners are completely happy to keep giving it to you. I recently interviewed someone that had returned to this country after visiting America briefly. She was most shocked by how no matter the problems the people in their communities had, they took it upon themselves to fix it. She was so surprised that people, when confronted with a problem, would actually step up and fix it. And it might be something that people in developed countries are so used to that they'd be drastically surprised by why would you see a problem in your community and not try to fix it? Well, because a foreign aid organization is just going to come in and do it. She hoped to bring that spirit back here to her own country. So to be clear, objection number three is that being independent but in some pain creates more pleasure than being dependent and in less pain. People gain pleasure from self-fulfillment while they when they solve a problem themselves, even if it would have been cheaper or easier to have someone else solve it. People gain more abilities and motivation to solve more problems and create pleasure in the future when they are given the opportunity to work to better their own communities today, instead of simply being handed the solution. There is a greater desire to stay home and prevent brain drain, the smartest in the country, leaving to go to other countries because they can get paid better there, when it is not the case that the only good things you see come from abroad. When in fact there are good things that you see happening that are created by your own country and by the people in your own country. When you see that, you're more likely to reinvest and the returns will compound because there will be more and more people working to better their own country as opposed to relying on aid and dependence. But you have to get off of that dependence train first. You have to start letting people be independent in what they're doing. Singer and Givewell underestimate the amount of good that is done and pleasure created by bringing someone out of dependence. It may cost more, and it may not be the most cost-effective way to solve the immediate problems, but it is more cost-effective to solve the long-term problems because you then allow the person to solve the problems themselves. Once again, Singer and Givewell underestimate the amount of good that is done and pleasure created by bringing someone out of dependence rather than keeping them in it. The perfect solution to the problems of inequality is to allow developing countries to stop being dependent on aid, not to put more aid on the problem that was caused by aid in the first place. This short-sighted viewpoint that would rather keep the people dependent and let 
then let them develop does more harm than good. Give well maximizes the good that we do with our money only by minimizing the good that we allow the local populations to do for themselves. For all of his bleeding heart utilitarianism, Singer views the recipients of aid not as people, but as numbers. He is not arguing for creating the most good, but rather for creating the most good that is the easiest to measure, that is the cheapest to measure. You can measure the amount of choice that someone has in a process, and you can measure the larger economic impact of your intervention. You can work on projects that decrease dependency and build capacity. The problem is that this measurement and these projects come with greater overhead costs than simply counting the number of bed nets that you give out. They don't save the most lives for the dollar, but they do the work in sustainable ways so that more lives will be saved in the future and farther down the line without us donating money. They inspire populations to try doing the work themselves. Even if that costs more now, it will be cheaper in the long run. GiveWell's charities sacrifice the autonomy and development of the people they are helping in the interest of telling donors that they have saved more lives. It is possible to give someone a life and independence. It just may cost a little more. Therefore, here's my argument. To do the most good, you must fund charities that save fewer lives per dollar but offer choice, independence, and economic stability for the population. Charities that focus on saving the most lives for the dollar cannot offer choice, independence, and economic stability. Charities promoted by GiveWell focus on saving the most lives for the dollar. Therefore, to do the most good, you should fund charities other than those promoted by GiveWell. Or, to put it another way, if you give someone a bed net, you'll keep them safe for five years. If you teach them how to make their own bed net factory, you will provide jobs, economic growth, independence, choice, and keep them safe for a lifetime. What do you think? Have I made my case? Should we teach people to save their own lives if that may mean some people do die in the process or just save their lives for them? If you want to promote questioning the claims of GiveWell, Singer, and the effective altruism movement, I encourage you to share this video. I am not saying that the necessarily the intentions of GiveWell and Singer are bad in any way. I'm saying that the results have problems. But as they are consequentialists inherently in their position, what should matter more is not their intentions, but their results. And so if you care about those results and you care about asking these charities to change the criteria that they use to analyze whether their work is being effective to include measures of independence versus dependence, choice, and long-term economic stability, I highly encourage you, more than I would other videos, to share this video. Pass this along to your friends that are involved in these things. See what they think. Maybe they have arguments against mine. Maybe they've seen things differently than I have. But from the perspective of someone in West Africa right now, I encourage you to give these people on the other end of aid a voice in what is being done to them. Watch this video and more at carnades.org and stay skeptical, everybody.